by the end of 1778 and into 1779, the British realize that their efforts in the north haven't been working. So they're now going to concentrate their efforts in the southern colonies. They still are going to occupy New York. They're not going to evacuate New York again. Um, but in the summer of 1780, the British start sending the army to the southern colonies, hoping on um, the support of the loyalists there. There were definitely more loyalist civilians in the southern colonies. The British are also hoping for uh, the slaves to join the British cause. The goal of the British Army is going to be to work their way back up and take control little by little. It's going to be difficult because of Francis Marion. He was known as the Swamp Fox. He had experience in the French and Indian War, mostly fighting Indians. And he is known for his guerrilla tactics, which are very difficult for the British to understand and to defend against. And his sort of nemesis, his arch nemesis, is this guy by the name of Ban Tarleton. Here's Ban Tarleton. And uh, he called him the Swamp Fox because he was so hard to catch. No one could ever catch him. And so the men that fight with Francis Marion, they are mostly locals. They, they really are a militia. They're not an official fighting unit. And they're going to be engaged at the Battle of Kings Mountain. This is in the fall of 1780. And this really is Patriot civilians versus Loyalist civilians. It really is about the militias. This is not the regular British army engaging and we're seeing um, sort of the fight especially in these southern colonies that there are lots of loyalists but these patriots truly believe in their cause. The patriot militia can, is considered to take the victory and for them this is a morale boost. Then just a few months later we have the Battle of Cowpent. The, um, the British were moving further inland and further north, and Cowpins is going to be uh, a small group of American soldiers, only 2,000 American soldiers and militia. But there's not a whole lot of British. There's only about 1,500 British. Remember, they are, in general, they are better trained. And um, George Washington had sent down a man by the name of Nathaniel Green, and he was going to be in charge of the American army in the South. In the Battle of Cowpens, uh, General Green uses, uses uh, everything to his advantage, especially the territory, so using these guerrilla tactics. He sets up his sharp shooters to um, attack the British, but he, he doesn't use them first. He uses the militia first, tells them to get off as many shots as they can, and then to retreat. And he's hoping to trick the British into thinking the Americans are giving up. What's really happening is while the British are sort of reveling in what they think is their victory, the American regular soldiers are going to sort of circle the way back around. They totally catch the British off guard. So again, this is considered a victory for the Americans, another boost to morale for the American cause, and it really discourages loyalists in the South. These loyalists who had believed in the British cause, supported the British, now they are seeing that maybe it's not going to be so effective. As this is happening, General Green is going to sort of give chase to, um, to the British forces throughout the South. Then that brings us into 1780, 1781, and we're going to come back to this issue of Benedict Arnold. You guys already know that he is a traitor, but why is he a traitor? So far, he has only been an American hero. Well, it has to do with Benedict Arnold becoming the military governor of Philadelphia. There, he meets a young lady by the name of Peggy Shippen, and you'll remember that before the Americans took control of Philadelphia, it was before that in the hands of the British. When the British controlled Philadelphia, young Miss Shippen meets a British officer by the name of John Andre, and he happened to be sort of the spy master for the British. 
they fall in love probably and then the british evacuate in 1778 when benedict arnold comes into philadelphia he falls in love with miss shippen and peggy had maintained her contact with john andre and over time is able to sort of connect these two men john andre convinces benedict arnold that he has been mistreated by the americans remember benedict arnold wanted to be a general he wanted to have the highest position possible and felt that he had been jilted he felt that he had been gypped by just given be, being given the military control of philadelphia so what these two agree on john andre says okay if you will give the british something they need the british will give you something you want under Benedict Arnold's control was the fort at West Point. You all have heard of the Military Academy at West Point, New York. John Andre and Benedict Arnold agree that the fort will be left sort of unguarded so that the British can take control of it. And they agree on this the night before everything is going to plan. And in return, Benedict Arnold is going to get 20,000 pounds, he is going to get the title and authority of a general in the British Army. This is September 1780. But as things are about to move, John Andre is captured. As soon as Benedict Arnold hears of this, he is at the breakfast table. He literally jumps out of his chair, runs down to the harbor, and, and uh, gets on the first British ship that he finds. John Andre is hanged and benedict arnold gets away he ends up serving in the british army but we now associate him he is a traitor to our cause while his plan did not succeed he abandoned the american cause all right back to the south general cornwallis general nathaniel green general green knows that the american army isn't as well trained isn't as technically advanced as the British, but the British are tired. So General Green is sort of using this tactic of almost engaging and then retreating, almost engaging and then retreating to pull the British further north and to wear them out. This is a war of attrition. We're trying to wear down the men and the supplies and the money. Ultimately, General Cornwallis decides that the British Army needs a rest, so he decides he's going to go to Yorktown, which is in Virginia. It's on the coast, and so he is planning that it will be easily pr protected by the British. But the problem with um, setting up camp on a river is you kind of are backed up against it. It doesn't give you many options. So the, the British Navy was prevented from getting to Yorktown by the French Navy. And here we see both French soldiers and American soldiers are going to encircle Cornwallis. This backfires for Cornwallis and he surrenders. And this is this is the last battle of the war, 1781. And when George III hears this, George III decides he's going to continue fighting. Um, but Parliament Parliament isn't sure. They, they think that it's worth continuing to try and get these territories back, but for all intents and purposes, the war is over, at least the fighting is over. The British Army is exhausted. They have, they have learned that the Americans will fight for their beliefs. Britain is going to still have some issues with France and Spain in the Caribbean, so these are going to be mostly naval uh, battles. And while the battles, once the battles stop, um, the British are still going to occupy their, their cities in North America. So the British are still in um, excuse me, Savannah, Georgia, Charleston, South Carolina, and uh, New York City. And they're going to stay there until the terms have been decided. So the war technically is not over, even though there is no more fighting. And the terms of that treaty are the Treaty of Paris. This was decided in 1783. They had been negotiating since 1782. And I love this painting. It has the five representatives of, of uh, the American party. There were two representatives from Britain. They didn't want to sit for the portrait because they were sore losers. Uh, some of the things that are really important in this treaty, the borders are decided. 
Um, here we see that the Americans gain a lot of territory. They more than doubled the size of the American states with this one document. The problem is, if you remember the proclamation line, the French and Indian War, that is a lot of Indian territory. So we'll see the results of that in future units. Other territorial things, France is going to get some more islands in the Caribbean. Spain is going to get Florida. The Netherlands will get some islands in the Caribbean as well. Probably the most important thing with this treaty is the United States is acknowledged as an independent country. When this treaty is ratified, this is when the British Army is going to evacuate New York City. So here we see George Washington rolling into New York City after the British have left. And with the video we watched in class, this was celebrated. This was a holiday for many, many years when the, new, when the British Army finally leaves the states. The war is officially entirely over. When this happens, George Washington could have remained in his position of general, but here we see him giving up his commission in the army. And this was one of the paintings we looked at at the very beginning of the school year. So all of these essential events that are in the rotunda of the United States Capitol building, we looked at the landing of Columbus, the discovery of the Mississippi, and we will see how trade becomes so important. The baptism of Pocahontas and how these new European communities interact with the natives. We also see her uncle in the foreground sort of plotting and brooding. We know eventually he will attack the colonists. We see the pilgrims from 1620, the focus on the Bible, on the family, how important that will be in establishing these communities in New England. The Declaration of Independence, where we are moving rather from trying to repair the situation with Great Britain to wanting to break away and be completely separate. 1777, the surrender of General Burgoyne, that this was a huge turning point for the war itself. And then we have the surrender of General Cornwallis at Yorktown and finally General Washington resigning his commission. So now that America is independent, it is a fresh start. We get to decide what we want to do with this new beginning. And so what are we going to do with our freedoms? Well, one important thing is individual rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, or if you're going according to John Locke, the right of property. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Another thing that um, each state is going to have to decide is the issue of church and state. Uh, if you remember, going back to when these colonies were founded, there are still differences that we will see throughout this course. In the North, we had the Congregationalist Church. In New England, communities are centered around the church, and church and state could not be separated. In these northern states, many of them will choose to continue financially supporting the Congregationalist Church through the government. So there is not a separation of church and state at this time. In the South, it is more um, it is more popular for the Church of England to be there. Remember, these were the English planters who came first with the goal of making money. And in the South, we have more of a case of definitely wanting a separation of church and state. If you remember the Church of England and its history, and uh, Henry VIII and all of that, you can see why they would want a, a separation between those two entities. Another thing that changes is property ownership. It is still going to be limited to white males, but one thing that changes that's pretty significant is inheritance. Under English law, the oldest son inherited the entire parcel of land. Now in the New World, there's a whole bunch of land and there's a whole bunch of people, and so land can be bought and sold to more people rather than the limitations that people had as English citizens. 
for women, they still can't really own property, but as a result of the revolution, they do gain a little bit more independence. They ran things while men were off fighting the war, and they raised children, and this is now seen as essential in a republic, to raise children with an understanding of their responsibilities as civilians. So that's going to fall to women to do that, and it's called the ideal of republican womanhood. We have the issue of the loyalists. We had almost 80,000 people who left the American colonies during the war and at the end of the war. For those who were wealthy enough, they probably went back to England if they really did not want to be part of America. Those who didn't have enough money, they might have gone to the Caribbean to work or try and buy some of those smaller plantations, and lots of them went to Canada. One thing that America had to agree to in the Treaty of Paris is that they would no longer confiscate the property of loyalists. But I can't imagine that people who had been vocal loyalists during the war would feel welcome in these new patriotic American communities. Then with the issues of slaves and free blacks, remember slaves had joined the British cause with the hope of gaining freedom. At the end of the war, they are returned to their owners. That's you know, that hasn't been a, any bonus for them. Um, some free blacks, they try and create their own communities, but there's still segregation up in the north. Many free blacks uh, end up moving back to Africa to the country of Sierra Leone. Eventually, some of the northern states will begin to outlaw slavery, but these are individual states. Right after the war in 1783, this is a United States only because they all broke away from Britain. They are all individuals. They all have individual rights. They are all going to run their states in different ways. And that's going to cause some problems that we'll see in the next unit.